Good evening, everyone, and welcome to TIFF Bell Lightbox. My name is Pierce Handling, Director and CEO of TIFF. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you here tonight for our screening of La Grande Illusion with Jonathan Vance. To begin with, we'd like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We're very grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. On behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and our public supporters, Ontario Creates and the Canada Council for the Arts. As a charitable organization, I'd also like to thank our donors and members, you, for making TIFF's year-round programming and educational and community outreach initiatives possible. Thank you very much. Now, tonight's event is part of the Great War on Film, a retrospective that commemorates the 100th anniversary of the armistice. We kicked off the series earlier this month and have screened the very best cinematic, cinematic depictions of the 20th century's first modern war. And we conclude the series on December the 9th, when Leah Cuff will be here to reflect on her own experiences of sending her husband, Mike Troner, to war and what his journey to recovery has been like for the two of them. She will be speaking after the screening of Xavier Beauvoir's Les Gardiennes. For more information about the films that remain in the series, please visit our website, tiff.net. And before we start tonight's screening, just a reminder to put your films on silent, please. And following the screening, Jonathan will join me on stage and we'll do a short Q&A with the audience. Um, there'll be microphones circulating per usual. So just please wait for them to come. Now, um, this evening's film is perceived as a cinematic masterpiece, one of Jean Renoir's greatest films, often mentioned in the same breath with La Règle du Jeu, Rules of the Game. And it's very interesting to me that in this interwar period, 1918 to 1939, Renoir's film really stood apart from the others that were showing in the series. It's a film about prisoners of war. And here to introduce the film is one of Canada's preeminent military historians and historians. Jonathan F. Vance is a distinguished university professor in the history department at Western University. He holds degrees from McMaster, Queens, and York Universities. He is the author of many books and articles, including Death So Noble, Unlikely Soldiers, Maple Leaf Empire, and more recently, A Township of War, which just appeared earlier this month, I think. So please now join me in welcoming Jonathan Vance. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this screening of uh, Renoir's masterpiece, uh, La Grande Illusion. The title, as you may know, is a reference to uh, a hugely influential book called The Great Illusion, published in 1909 by Norman Angel, uh, a British journalist, author, uh, publicist, spokesperson, and member of parliament for the Labour Party. Uh, Angel was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1933 for his peace activism in the 1920s and early 1930s. He was a legendary figure in interwar pacifist movements. But this book, The Great Illusion, was his uh, kind of first big splash. And the illusion, as he saw it, and as he uh, referred to in the title, was that any country could gain by war. He thought that was the big illusion. And his book offers, offered a sustained argument that this was a myth no country could ever or has ever gained by war. That regardless of what you think at the beginning, the costs are always going to outweigh the benefits. And any benefits that you perceive will be illusory and probably uh, not worth the effort. Now, uh, the book was first published in 1909, as I said. When the First World War began in 1914, there was a considerable amount of debate over Angel's argument. Did the coming of the First World War actually prove his thesis, or did it disprove his thesis? And he became something uh, of a popular figure on the speaking circuit in Britain uh, on that very question. I would suggest to you that the film tonight gives one answer to that uh, side of the debate, which uh, does the war, does it prove or disprove his argument? It's been said that captivity is the most ubiquitous experience in modern warfare. Uh, one historian estimated that during the Second World War, one person in every thousand 
was in prisoner at some point. One, one in every thousand globally. That's a, an enormous number of people. Captivity historically has been no respecter of age, of gender, of health, of class, of religion, or of anything else for that matter. Everyone is and has been vulnerable to captivity. Doesn't matter if you're in a friendly state, in an enemy state, uh, in a neutral state, or in your own state. Uh, you may well find yourself imprisoned for uh, various reasons, uh, real or illusory. The First World War was arguably the first instance in which captivity was a mass experience. And certainly for governments at the time, uh, the number of captives that they had to deal with was overwhelming. Uh, remember yet that they didn't have the Second World War experience uh, as a guide where, where captivity becomes even more significant. And in the Great War, the bulk of these prisoners of war tended to be captured in large groups. And so governments and armies found themselves dealing with tens of thousands of new prisoners uh, on very short notice. And this created huge logistical challenges no matter where in the globe uh, you were. On the Eastern Front, there were some five million prisoners of war, Russian, German, Austro-Hungarian. In the Middle East, uh, something around a quarter of a million, mostly from the Ottoman Empire. On the Western Front, probably 600,000 or so from the Entente side, 800,000 from the Central Powers, so that's another 1.4 million. And those are the numbers only for military prisoners, prisoners of war. You can add to that uh, an un untold number of civilians who were interned for varying periods and for varying reasons in various countries, including in this country, uh, where members of the Austro-Hungarian Empire were interned in Canada uh, to the number of some 8,700. All told, civilian intern is a million, two million, three million, we really don't know. But the numbers were staggering to governments at the time, and they were in no way prepared to deal with these numbers. So in most countries, uh, the authorities resorted to reusing existing structures rather than building new camps. When we think of prison camps, uh, we think of camps that we are familiar with from the Second World War. These sort of generic compounds uh, full of identical huts stretched over the landscape. These are really uh, a feature of the Second World War, not the First World War. Uh, in the First World War, we have reused buildings in facilities. And in Germany, where most of the film tonight is set, that meant fortresses, boarding schools, barracks, uh, factories, uh, in one case, a horse racing track uh, in Berlin, uh, and yes, castles. So the kind of prisoner accommodation that you see in the film tonight uh, was entirely typical. Uh, hockey magnate Con Smythe was a prisoner of war in Germany uh, after he was shot down in October 1917. And if you look at photographs that were taken of the camps in which Con Smythe lived, looks a little like a typical boarding school of the time, uh, because some of the buildings actually had been boarding schools. Uh, and in fact, in a number of the shots, there is something, I would say, Hogwartsian of, about them. They have that kind of feel about them, although Con Smythe would have disagreed about the level of comfort available. So the scale of captivity alarmed governments uh, and forced them into rather desperate measures simply to house hundreds of thousands of prisoners who came in on short notice. But if the scale of captivity was unexpected to governments, captivity itself was unexpected to the people concerned. Uh, soldiers generally contemplate in advance of battle that they might be killed in action, and I'm sure we've all seen films in which uh, our hero writes a letter to his mother or to his wife or to his girlfriend uh, and leaves it with the padre to be delivered if he gets the chop at some point. Uh, if you were here for the screening of Gallipoli, uh, you will have seen in the scene uh, before the big advance, uh, a number of the soldiers uh, quickly writing notes to their loved ones, assuming that they would be uh, killed over the next few minutes. If you saw Paths of Glory, uh, you remember that's that wonderful scene uh, where the one soldier discourses upon the different ways to be killed on the battlefield. Uh, 
uh, and which way to die is preferable to which other way to die. So soldiers thought about this. They thought about this a lot, how they were going to meet their end, if they were going to meet their end, when they were going to meet their end. They also thought about being wounded. That was something that they considered. And in the First World War, uh, for example, the holy grail for a British soldier uh, was called the Blighty, a nice clean minor wound that would get you sent back to Britain, but wasn't serious enough to do actually any permanent damage. Uh, and so the apocryphal story, which is, is uh, almost certainly true, uh, is of the uh, soldier walking backwards from the advance, uh, proudly holding his arm up in the air, showing all his buddies the bullet hole he's got, uh, and him giving great cheers uh, as he makes his way back to the uh, field hospital because they know that for the short time, for the short term, he is out of the war. So soldiers thought about whether they might be killed or whether they might be wounded. They seem not to have considered whether they would be captured. Uh, captivity rarely entered into their pre-battle rituals, nor did it enter into their training. People were not prepared for how to deal with captivity. To quote one Canadian officer uh, who was unfortunate enough to be captured in 1915, being taken prisoner was like a bastard mule, born of misadventure, reared in reluctance, and its only virtue is its inability to beget its kind. So that is a, a, a pretty good statement uh, of how soldiers viewed captivity. Part of the reason why they never considered it was because it was a thing that should never be considered, because captivity was shameful. It was assumed that if you were captured, you had let down the side. Uh, you had not quite lived up to your bargain uh, with king and country. And in fact, if you were any kind of a soldier at all, you would not have been captured. Uh, you would have chosen death over capture. Capture represented failure. And indeed, even into the Second World War, uh, many armies still had on the books, under military law, the stipulation that whenever anyone was captured, there had to be a court of inquiry to determine if there was negligence involved. If you got captured through negligence, uh, you were subject to military discipline. Obviously, with the circumstances of the Second World War, uh, those sorts of courts were not uh, possible to convene, but they were still legally on the books. So this connection of shame with captivity explains, I think, why so many prisoners of war reported intense feelings of guilt uh, during their captivity and afterwards. Whether or not they believed it consciously, certainly unconsciously, they seem to have assimilated uh, the notion that if they fell into enemy hands, they were at least partly to blame and maybe entirely to blame. Imagine getting this letter about your son who had been in action. This was an actual letter written by uh, a Canadian officer, 1916. It may be possible that your son is a prisoner, but the general belief of both officers and men who knew him is that he would not be taken prisoner. He was too good a soldier for that. So translation, I think, dear Mr. and Mrs. Smith, your son is probably dead, but look on the bright side, at least he wasn't captured. That's essentially the message. Or imagine getting this letter from your father saying, again, I quote, I can only assume that you were unconscious when you were captured. Translation, if you had been conscious, you would have fought to the death. So we wouldn't be having this exchange. So this sense of guilt uh, exerted a powerful uh, effect on the psyche of soldiers uh, and explained in some measure the psychological consequences of captivity, uh, a condition that in later wars would be known as barbed wire-itis. And the sense of guilt, I think, helps to explain why some prisoners were so driven to uh, attempt escape. Having, uh, if you like, blotted their copybook by the very fact of being captured, uh, they felt they had to do something to make up for it, uh, and escaping was a way to make up for it. Yes, it was regarded as an officer's duty to attempt to escape, but many prisoners of war would probably have attempted it uh, even without that sense of duty. It was a way to fight back, to fight back at the enemy and to atone for having been captured by the enemy in the first place. <clears throat> 
Now, popular culture has told us a lot about the institution of captivity in the 20th century, uh, particularly in the Second World War. Uh, we have probably all seen the movies, the television shows, uh, the computer games perhaps, uh, the books, uh, board games when I was a child in the 70s. Uh, we had uh, a board game called Escape from Kolditz, uh, where you could move around the board and escape from this castle uh, in Germany. Hugely popular. However, much of what you might have read about prisoners of war uh, from the Second World War actually doesn't apply to the First World War, uh, at least uh, as far as officers are concerned. For example, uh, officers in the First World War tended not to be segregated by nationality, as they almost invariably were in Nazi Germany. So you would see living together in the same compound, French, British, Rus Russian, Belgian, other Entente officers, uh, something you would rarely see in the Second World War. Uh, and if you're looking for a, uh, 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 a fun drinking game during tonight's movie, uh, see if you can spot all the different officers from different nationalities, uh, take a drink every time you see a new one, uh, and see how far you get, because there are lots of them. For enlisted men, uh, conditions of captivity were brutal in both wars, but for officers, uh, they were not, uh, in the First World War at least. Um, the conditions that you'll see in the film tonight uh, were generally representative, and in fact, officers were able to live quite comfortably in captivity until late in the First World War. For example, uh, for most of the war, there are very few restrictions on what could be sent into prison camps. Fine wines, sweets, baked goods, cooked chicken in glass jars, caviar, escargot, all of it found its way into prison camps. It was possible for a number of reasons. Uh, it was possible because, unlike the Second World War, land transport in and out of Germany was relatively easy. A prisoner, for example, could order baskets of food from stores in Switzerland or even in Paris. Uh, and because Switzerland was neutral, they would be shipped into German prison camps by Swiss shipping companies. Uh, and you'll see in the film, uh, Renoir's Rosenthal receives packages containing all sorts of treats from the finest French shops. Uh, this was in no way out of the ordinary. The fact that um, prisoners were able to, officer prisoners were able to eat uh, surprisingly well, was also conditioned by the um, kind of old school mentality that obtained in German prison camps. Just because an officer had been captured uh, didn't mean that he had given up the right to be treated as a gentleman. And as you'll see in the film, this represented the last gasp, I would say, of the old aristocratic order and the sense of chivalry that had dominated war for so long. There was held to be a bond between officers that crossed national borders. Uh, and the bond was especially strong between aviators. Uh, these knights of the air, as they were known at the time, were the closest thing that the 20th century had to medieval knights. And so airmen became the embodiment of medieval modes of warfare. Uh, and so, as to honor that, I've worn my uh, Wallace and Gromit tie uh, in solidarity with our characters tonight. And you'll see in the film some, some stereotypical uh, and completely accurate references to the kinds of, of ceremonies, the kind of comradeship uh, that aviators of different nationalities embraced and shared. There is uh, a really interesting dynamic in the film between von Raffenstein, Marshall, and de Beaulieu. Raffenstein and de Beaulieu represent the old aristocracy. They share this kind of medieval, idealized sense of chivalry. Marshall is not an aristocrat, but at least he's an aviator. Uh, so that's a bit of a compensation in his favor. Is it enough to overcome his roots? Well, you'll see. The other factor to keep in mind is that in captivity in the First World War, uh, officers were almost always segregated from other ranks usually in entirely different camps, largely because officers were not required to work. And so their captivity was marked by inactivity. Uh, perhaps their greatest enemy was boredom. And that, of course, was another factor behind the psychological traumas that prisoners experienced. 
Uh, Con Smythe, uh, later in life, uh, recalled that when he was a prisoner of war, uh, he spent so much time playing bridge that after he got back to Canada, he could never abide the game again. Uh, couldn't sit through another game of bridge for the rest of his life. Uh, officer prisoners had a lot of time to, to do things, to entertain themselves, to do things like perform theatricals, uh, complete with costumes uh, and musical instruments that might be sent in by organizations like the YMCA. Uh, they might even be purchased from local shops uh, if the camp commander was amenable. Watch for the scene uh, tonight where the, the uh, costumes and theatrical material arrive uh, in the camp. It's a wonderful scene and uh, entirely accurate. Uh, I would say. And in fact, a lot of great actors uh, got their start in prison camp, uh, which some people uh, may not know. If you're uh, a fan of the 1963 film The Great Escape, you will remember uh, Donald Pleasance, who played the forger, uh, um, Colin Blythe. Uh, Donald Pleasance was a prisoner in 1944-45. Uh, his first acting gigs were in a prison camp uh, and came to fame later playing a prisoner himself. The other thing, of course, that officers had plenty of time for was planning escapes. And escapes served a number of purposes in any prison camp. Men, I think, nourished the possibility that they might get home. But for the great majority of them, that was not their most realistic goal. They knew that getting out of the camp was, in fact, the easy part. The hard part was traveling unnoticed through an enemy country uh, and across a border to safety. And in fact, of all the documented prison camp escapes, uh, only a handful were actually access successful in that the escaper reached neutral territory or friendly territory. Nevertheless, escaping gave them a sense of purpose. It gave them something meaningful to do when they had nothing else meaningful to do. It helped them to combat feelings of guilt, feelings of idleness. It made the time go by quickly. It was an antidote to boredom. It was a form of resistance. Uh, an important form of resistance because they were living in an atmosphere in which they had very few possibilities to resist. We know that many people who escaped during the Second World War were actually familiar with escape stories from the First World War. These escape stories had been bestsellers in the 20s and 30s. Uh, Schoolboys in particular loved them. Uh, so when these readers were captured in the Second World War, they had the chance to act out the childhood fantasies that they dreamed up from reading escape literature. By the same token, uh, filmmakers who tackled the Second World War prisoner of war experience were indebted to films of the First World War, and this one in particular. And tonight you'll see many references to uh, the Second World War experience of captivity. Uh, so again, if you're a fan of the film The Great Escape, uh, or Stalag 17, uh, or even Hogan's Heroes, uh, you will see tonight visual cues uh, that those later directors took from Renoir's film. But to conclude, in 1642, uh, an English poet named Richard Lovelace uh, wrote a very famous verse to his uh, dear Althea, to Althea from prison. The best known lines from that poem, uh, stone walls do not a prison make nor iron bars a cage. As you'll see shortly, Stone walls do make a prison, but there are other things that make a prison as well. Nationalism, ideology, class, prejudice, all of these things make prisons. There are many prisons in this film and many prisoners. As you'll see, some of the prisoners are only dimly aware that they are in fact imprisoned and others are painfully aware that they are in bondage. And as you'll see right now, some prisoners will find that freedom is easier to attain for them than for others. So enjoy. Remarkable. Um, yeah, so Jonathan, yeah, have a seat. I and mean, there's so much to say about this film. Uh, we can talk about the prisoner of war thing. I thought I loved your introduction. Um, but maybe what I'll, I'll talk about or you know, just sort of ask to explore immediately is this whole notion of class and nation. Uh, the loyalties there and what he does with this and just your thoughts about that I guess just in a very general kind of sense because this is the dialectic he really sets up in the film exactly yeah the the um, meaningless of meaninglessness of these artificial distinctions and it comes up wonderfully at the end where where uh, 
Uh, Rosenthal said borders are, are, are man-made, nature doesn't care about them. Uh, and I think that is really in that line, you get the essence of the film, the essence of what he's trying to do with the relationships between the characters on both sides of the war. And I think, I mean, if you, if you look at it that way, uh, it's very clear why the Nazis hated this film, uh, because it was all about that, the sort of indivisibility of humanity uh, and the, the, the destruction that artificial divisions can cause. Uh, it's not an uncommon view for this, for this time period, but it's remarkably well enunciated in that film. Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, um, class doesn't win out. Well, class does win out in this film, wins out over, over uh, nation. Uh, when you've got this the very hierarchical structure of the two senior officers, and then, of course, you've got a different, very different class below that, even though they're officers. And then I think the final connection, when they, are lib when they meet the German woman, and, of course, she is very much of their class, mm -hmm. uh, that's where the film, for me, becomes quite extraordinary, actually, the last quarter of it. And it's it's very much the uh, the kind of struggle between the old world and the new world, uh, and the the I mean I've always found that von Rauschenstein is the great tragic figure because he is the one who's condemned to live on, that doesn't have the luxury of dying as uh, Bourdieu does. And you mentioned in your introduction that this was in in a way the end of the aristocracy, the end of this kind of moment in European history, I guess where there was this code of chivalry uh, that existed across nation states uh, it, that w really was a kind of a class thing. And it's drawn so well here. I mean, they, s they speak multiple languages. They've been to the same places, the same restaurants. They've seen each other race horses, et cetera, et cetera. They, they have this kind of, th th they're not divided by, by, uh, by, by language or by nation at all. They're, they're truly internationalists in a kind of classic sense. And what for me is, is I suppose, the underlying uh, power is that they both recognize that they're dinosaurs. They both recognize that they're uh, representatives of a world that no longer exists or will, will very soon cease to exist. But they both recognize that they're, they're prisoners of that. They cannot be anything else. Uh, even though times have changed, the world has changed, they are uh, part of the past, they can only go on with their lot as it's been dealt to them. Uh, and and that's a very powerful message. The other part of the film that I found really interesting is the whole notion of, uh, you touched on it again in, in your introductory comments, the childish nature of this, the first part of the film. You know, they're in snowball fights, they're dressing up. I mean, it's almost like um, a boy's own movie in a funny way. And then, of course, the final part of the film is they actually become adults again. When they escape, they become parents. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they move into a very different psychological space, um, and I love that that aspect of the film too. Yeah, I mean that that's the thing about that's why prisoners of war books and and uh, were so popular in the interwar period because it was all just a, a kind of schoolyard game. Uh, it was so much fun, and it was in this controlled environment, and and you could you could uh, uh, tweak the nose of the enemy and get away with it. Uh, and so it was very much a kind of childish uh, atmosphere. And it's when you get into the real world that they're forced to confront the, the, uh, that they're human beings, they're, they're adults, they have to deal with real issues, not in a kind of hermetically sealed environment of a prison camp. When you were doing your research, um, is there this notion that wounded officers, like the, the, the character that, uh, uh, the Raffenstein character played by von Stroheim, that wounded officers went on to run some of these camps. Was this was 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 this an exception or was this common? That who, was who are the people that were actually running the the uh, the POW camps? That was very common. It it tends to be older officers who are medically unfit for other duties, and in fact, uh, the guard companies tended to be older soldiers who are medically unfit for other duties, and you see that there. They're kind of the the maimed and the blinded and the rabble of the halt, uh, and but for commandants, I mean, it was not. This was. The characterization was wonderful because a lot of these individuals in reality are very much like Reifenstein. They are career soldiers, and for them to be common jailers uh, is a, a real come down. And they struggle with that. They struggle with the fact that this is, after all their, their service, this is all they can do. They, they can be common jailers to a bunch of uh, uh, fractious POWs. In fact, there's a, that wonderful line that he speaks. This is the only way I can serve my, father, exactly. my the yeah. fatherland, yeah. I guess, at this point in time. Which, again, expresses the, the, the fact that he is a person and he is a representative of a class is now all but useless.
Is there anything in the film that you find that, uh, that, that um, in some ways false or that doesn't really ring true in terms of the research you've done? Or is this really a very, very accurate historical re representation of what went on? I mean, so much of it, you said, mm -hmm. resonates. You mm -hmm. know, the, um, it's, it's a very accurate portrait. I'm just wondering if there's anything that doesn't uh, resonate or, or um, feel... I was looking for that because, I mean, historians are, are, are annoying people to watch movies with. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, we're the worst kind of buzzkill imaginable because something goes wrong in the first five minutes and the whole thing is shot for you. Uh, but I actually couldn't find anything in that, that film that undermined my confidence in, in uh, the setting of the stage. Uh, it's, it's even the, from the, the kind of general setting to the way it looked, the way the camp looked, the way they would have interacted with each other. Uh, to little tiny things like the construction of the tunnel uh, and the conduct of the guards, uh, I thought was spot on. I thought it was just terrific. Is there, did a lot of them write memoirs? Is it written down in any way at all? Or is this, be, be, because again, you, said, you mentioned in your introduction that to be captured as a POW meant you'd failed somehow and you had to be, f you, know, you obviously feel full of guilt that you mm -hmm. had been captured. Did many of them write their memoirs? I mean, I've written a lot, or I've read a lot yeah. of the, the memoirs, written, they have some extraordinary ones. And I'm just trying to remember, are there any written by people who were in prison? There are a lot written by people who were prisoners of war. But in the, in the 20s and 30s, they were almost entirely people who had escaped. And so that was their way of overcoming the sense of guilt from captivity. It's not until after the Second World War when a person who was just a run-of-the-mill prisoner who didn't do anything gallant would kind of deign to write their memoirs. Uh, in the early days, the, the only kind of suitable subject for an ex-prisoner was, was a tale of escape. And there's, there's plenty of those. Uh, from um, British prisoners, Canadian, French, uh, some German uh, prisoners as well. And they all have that, that sort of narrative of, of overcoming their guilt by carrying on the fight uh, in captivity, by eventually getting out of captivity. I just read a memoir of de Gaulle, and I had, had no idea that he spent two and a half years in prison. And of course, he was a great writer, wrote a lot. Did de Gaulle talk about this? Do you know if he talked about this in his memoirs at all, his, his time in, in, mm -hmm. in as, as a POW? I mean, de Gaulle was, was also uh, kind of lived the guilt, the same, the same thing. Um, but he later in his life, he, he uh, turned that prison experience into a, a, a sort of cachet because he could, he could say that he had been so much closer to the Germans in captivity. He understood them better. Uh, he knew what they were capable of. Uh, and and it gave him a kind of leg up on on others. So he was able to to turn it into a an object lesson, I suppose you might say. Uh, but at the time, what a what a great shock to be captured by by a, a to be captured for a a, a a kind of up and coming young officer who who sees great things among uh, ahead of them, and then suddenly the the prison wall comes down, and that's that. He actually learned to speak German, I think, during his time, which was quite something, I guess that. That did him well in the future, and I think surprised a lot of Germans as well. Well, that was one of the, um, I mean, a lot of, of prisoners put their time to good use. Uh, in, in the Second World War, particularly, you could finish your university degree in prison camp. Uh, if you weren't really up to escaping, uh, there was lots of other things you could do to, to make the time go a little more quickly. And is it, was it a fantasy of Renoir that they would actually be uh, uh, protected and hidden by a German woman, by the Germans, did th was this some? Were there stories of this in the in the First World War? Prisoners of war escaping and being protected and hidden by Germans. There were uh, there are there are stories like that on on uh, uh, all sides involving British prisoners, uh, 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 French escapers, and I think the we tend to forget how much uh, in a kind of uh, mountain village like that or or a mountain farmhouse you would be isolated from the war. I mean, Elsa lost her, what, her husband and two brothers, uh, and yet she's off in this um, uh, mountain fastness, if you like, and the war seems to be to be very far away. And I think she's a, a, a nice symbol of the fact that, that individuals who, on the one hand, uh, have been devastated by war by losing uh, so many of their family, on the other hand, have not lost their essential humanity. Uh, and I think so. I think it's a it's a it's a real life episode that Renoir uses very effectively in that regard. Let's talk a little bit about the German prisoners of war. What happened to them? 
POWs, were they mostly t taken to the UK, or did some of them end up in Canada, as they did in the Second World War? Uh, not in not in Canada in the First World War. Uh, they mostly stayed in in France and the UK. Um, there were uh, the the officers typically went to the UK, and the enlisted men stayed in in France. Uh, it was um, and if you read uh, the memoirs of of German POWs in Britain, they're very similar to this. Uh, I mean, there it really is a kind of international experience. The the German prisoners do their theatricals and they have their orchestras and they they try to escape. I mean, the the the, the situation they deal with is that you escape from a camp in Britain, then where do you go? Uh, so there's there's less. I mean, for them, escape is kind of a joke because there's no real chance of getting away. But you change the language and it's it's essentially the same experience. They're in boarding schools and and it's the same sort of thing. Let's open it up to the uh, audience for questions. Mike, that's going to be passed around over here. Maybe we can get the gentleman right in the middle here who raised his hand immediately. I can probably do that. That's pretty good, actually. I can hear you. I'm curious, in, in your opening addresses, the numbers involved were staggering for me that there was 5 million on the Eastern Front. Was that experience anything like the two experiences you've described here that the film described? On the Eastern Front, the, the, the experience for officers would have been roughly similar uh, because, as the film indicates, officers had a kind of special status, even on the Eastern Front, when, when it's um, a very different war. For other ranks, for enlisted men, uh, the riflemen, it is in the East, uh, a dismal experience, uh, very high death rates in the in the Middle Eastern theater as well. Um, the experience there is much closer to what it was like in the Second World War: mass starvation, disease, uh, abuses of of uh, uh, astonishing vigor. Um, in some cases, 40, 50 percent death rates in certain camps. They become in the East essentially not prisoners of war, but slave laborers. Uh, and the fact that the officers are are separated from their men in that respect works against the men because the officers are are supposedly to kind of protect their men in captivity but they're all shifted off into relatively more pleasant uh, camps and their men are left to to starve and be worked to death and and die of, of typhus and typhoid and all these diseases that run rampant through the camps so a very different uh experience to the officers but a very similar to experience to the same kind of soldier in the Second World War. Over here. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the movie doesn't portray a kind of pan-Europeanism that existed before the Second World War, during the Second World War, before these artificial boundaries were drawn up at the end of the war, and the French, the Germans, the aristocracy anyway, were friends, they were comrades, they were from the same family. And then the European Union tried to regain that feeling of pan-Europeanism. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on that, please? Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons, uh, one of the many reasons why uh, Nazi Germany d disliked this film intensely, because it did presuppose this this idea of uh, a united Europe. And for the Nazis, that would have been socialist uh, and therefore unacceptable. But in the film, I think Renoir is making the, the same case that a lot of other people like Norman Angel made in the 20s and 30s, and the case that um, some of the labor unions had made at the late later years of the war, that the one thing the First World War showed is that the common soldiers from Britain, from France, from Germany, from Italy, from Russia, whatever, are all essentially the same. Uh, it's the dynasties at the top where the problems are. So if you get rid of the dynasties at the top, then European society can exist quite comfortably uh, together because there's really not that much that separates the average person. And I think the irony in, in the film is that uh, Raufenstein and, and Bourdieu buy into that as well. Uh, they live this kind of trans-European existence. They're comfortable in all European societies. Europe is their nation, uh, so to speak. Uh, 
And so I think that is a, a very kind of forward-looking uh, idea, especially when the um, assumption was that one of the, the great causes of the First World War was European nationalism. Uh, and Renoir is talking about a kind of anti-European nationalism, Europeanism, if you want to call it that. That's exactly what made the Nazis dislike it. Uh, so in some ways, Renoir was, was a few decades ahead of his time. Well, in many ways, I would say. Although it's funny that duty traps both of those senior officers or both of those aristocrats at the end of the day. They, they both use that word in a very strong sense. You know, it's our duty to, and presumably duty to escape, which they're, they're trapped in their own kind. You talked about prisons earlier, Jonathan. They're trapped in their own prison yeah. of duty to the nation state in a funny and way. And yeah, their prison is a national prison. And the, the tragedy is that they recognize that and they see the problem in it, exactly. but they're trapped in it. There's nothing they can do. Uh, except die in the best way possible. Over here. We'll just get you a microphone. Your voice isn't quite as strong as the <laughs> gentleman's. Um, there's another interesting aspect I found in the film. De Beaulieu seems to be able to overcome, to a certain extent, his s separation from the class, the, l the working class. You see over the course of the film, he doesn't lose his identification with um, Rofenstein, but he also becomes closer to, to the other soldiers in his camp. And at the end, I think, he actually ends up, well, he allies himself with the future. He allies himself with the common man. Yeah. Whereas Rofenstein, perhaps because he, the role he plays in the film and the role the Germans played as the gatekeepers, as the... As the um, uh, the people who held people in prison, they couldn't make any kind of rapprochement amongst themselves. Because we saw in the scene where the, the French are performing and their freedom of movement, their joie de vivre, and we saw the Germans um, to the side who were clearly a, a bit uncomfortable um, with what was going on and the sense throughout the film of restriction mm -hmm. in, their, in their role. I don't know if other people felt that or... I, I agree with you mostly. I, w I would disagree, though. I think what the, the kind of realization that Baudia comes to is that he, in fact, has a kind of aristocratic noblesse oblige. Uh, he, he is born and lives for service. And his final act in serving his, the society that, that produced him is to give his life for uh, those lower in the, in the social scale than him. And so on one hand, yes, he, he, he reconciles to that. But on the other hand, what the, the course of action he takes is, is entirely in keeping with, with his conception of duty. And I think in the, in the deathbed scene, uh, what you see there is essentially um, him, uh, Baudieu, saying to Raufenstein, I'm the lucky one that I got the chance to do this. You are condemned to live on. Uh, without that opportunity to to fulfill your final role as a member of the aristocracy, that's what I take from it. Uh, it it's either way, it's a, a kind of tragic end, uh, but that's I guess that's modernism. It's almost like a sacrifice scene. I think that would be the word I would use. Yeah. He kind of sacrifices himself. It's, it is a kind of a gesture, yeah, mm -hmm. as opposed to completely aligning himself with his with Marshall and the Rosenthal. He sacrifices himself for them. Yeah, there's a kind of a funny recognition that he is of the his time has passed, um, and he's not going to be a mm -hmm. part of it. And notice he he can't um, he defends Rosenthal and, and Marshall uh, to Raufenstein, but he he can't really talk to Marshall on on kind of human terms because there's a line there uh, that that he can't cross. Now, however much he he recognizes he should. And so his way of crossing the line is, is to dot, to sacrifice himself for, for the two escapers. Anybody else? Yeah, let's get you a mic. I, I would agree with the previous speaker that Renoir does show um, a bias bias towards uh, the French, that the French seem to be more forward thinking and more flexible. And for example, uh, Bordeaux was asked to give his word that there was 
No, nothing happening in his room to the German commander. Mm -hmm. Well, he gave his word. He was lying. He wasn't playing the game that the German commander was playing. Except technically he was being truthful because the rope was outside his room. So he was actually being completely honest, uh, as only a member of the aristocracy could be. Um, I'm interested in the way that um, Renoir treated the issue of anti-Semitism. Uh, it was always there with, I felt, with Rosenthal, with the questions that he was asked, but where was he really from? And then the end with Michelle coming up with that sort of, you know, slur at the end when uh, he gets really frustrated. Um, so it, it kind of, for me, it kind of came in and out, but it was always there. I wonder whether you had any comment about what you thought Renoir was trying to say in portraying it that way. I mean, I, I think, I mean, Renoir is, an, uh, is a bright guy. He knows what's going on. He can't pretend that, that anti-Semitism in Europe in the 30s is not uh, a vicious, uh, ferocious ideology. Uh, and I think what he's, he's reminding us is that even with people who have uh, been to hell and back with each other, uh, even with people who are, are on the surface, um, tolerant and open-minded and, and uh, uh, um, warm-hearted and forthcoming. Uh, you scratch too deeply and, and um, prejudice is there. So I think he's, he's reminding us that that, uh, that is always there within us uh, as humans. Uh, and even those two who had, who had uh, lived together, escaped together, fought together, traveled together, spent endless hours together, knew each other better than anyone else. When things go bad, uh, they resort to these, uh, uh, these terrible anti-Semitic slurs. Uh, and I think maybe that's a reminder that, well, you know, don't get too comfortable. Uh, this is a, is a positive vision, but it's not, it's not unalloyed. There's some nasty stuff lingering there, so watch out for that. I think it's a kind of warning to us, I would guess. Yeah, it's extraordinary that he doesn't avoid the subject. He actually confronts it straight on, I agree. What's also interesting for me is there's a black man in the film. There's a black soldier. I mean, he hardly has a word. In fact, I'm not even sure if he has one line of dialogue in the film, but he's still there in the film. It's, that's an interesting addition uh, because the, I mean, I, I, no one could suggest that France in, in the First World War was, was racially tolerant. However, uh, they relied very much on, on African divisions, African soldiers. And they were far more racially tolerant than the American army when they arrived uh, in France. Uh, and in fact, when the Americans started to come to France in numbers, uh, the US with, a, w a, as you know, a deeply segregated army, uh, the French were horrified by this. Uh, the fact that they would, that the Americans would treat white soldiers one way and black soldiers another way. Uh, and they, the French government was constantly getting on the American uh, um, high command to say, look, you can't, you can't do this. Uh, this is France. You can't treat people like that. Didn't the Canadian Army also follow the Americans in, in a way? Our, our treatment of black soldiers during the First World War is not exemplary either, was it? It's not exemplary. Uh, our treatment of, of name and ethnic minority uh, was not exemplary. Uh, it was a... Um, and so in that sense, uh, you'd probably argue that the, the French Army was more forward-thinking uh, than others. Um, uh, so the introduction of that soldier was a, a, a curious sort of... Uh, addition to the cast, um, but almost because he has he plays such a little role in the in the story, almost as a kind of visual cue more than anything. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, 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 thank you. I agree with your comments about the uh, anti-Semitism and with that lady's uh, comments as well. Um, as much as I love the movie. The fact that the Jewish character is very wealthy and reminds us of Rothschild um, made me uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable when I saw it years ago. Now, I realize he's an officer, so again, perhaps coming from a wealthier background, but it just seems Renoir is using a certain stereotype too. Maybe it's positive because he's very generous but he's wealthy, 
and again, kind of Rothschild-like. So I don't know, maybe he can't escape some of the prejudices either. But as you say, he's also showing us the anti-Semitism that comes out when people um, let their guard down. So that's good too. I, I think, yeah, he, he's using the Rosenthal character as, uh, um, it's a stereotype, so he's using it as a symbol rather than as a, as a fully formed individual, I suppose you'd say. Um, and it, it is, I mean, he, I think you're right, he, he falls back on the same sort of tendencies, that, the very tendencies that he's criticizing. Um, Um, I was just going to say, in the First World War, a lot of officers' positions were bought. Not in the First World earned. War. That in was that was in the War 19th the century. No, I thought in the First World War it was still going on. Wasn't no, it? It, no, it had been it had been banned in the 19th century. Oh, However, okay. uh, it is true though that that in the French army, in the British army, in the German army, less so in the German army, uh, your chance of commission depended upon wealth and status. So you didn't actually buy your your officers' stripes. But it was expensive being an officer. Uh, you had to buy your own uniform. You had to had to pay mess bills. You had to buy food for your 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 troops. Uh, so for for the pre-war officer class, although um, the sale of commissions had had been outlawed, effectively you still did have to have financial resources. Um, that changes quite a bit during the war. But these are obviously all holdovers from the from the pre-war uh, army. Uh, and I mean, having said that. Uh, you have um, British officers getting in baskets of food from Harrods uh, delivered to uh, uh, places at the front. Uh, it, it is, so the old world of, of the privileged moneyed class, uh, it's also the end of that old world in this, uh, in this film, I think. Would it be fair to say, just building on that question, the British Army was somewhat different than the Continental Armies because it was not a conscription army, it was a fully volunteer army. So the British cavalry officer would have been absolutely 100% from the aristocratic class, or certainly the upper class, because they could afford it. It was cavalry, horses, the whole bit. Yeah. Um, so would one draw that distinction, Jonathan, between e the Continental Armies and the... Yeah, the even, even late in the war, the, the British officer class was very much a class. A social class. So, uh, um, read the memoirs of, of Harold Macmillan, later prime minister, who was was eighteen, I think, at Cambridge University, uh, and because he was at Cambridge University, he got a commission. So he was a captain at eighteen, and found himself in command in the trenches of all these guys who were thirty, forty years old who'd been in the army for twenty years, uh, only because he had been at Cambridge. Uh, so that persists uh, in Britain. You don't see. The situation that you see in in uh, Canada, anyways, my my great uncle was a um, uh, worked in an ice cream store. Uh, he became a, an officer during the war because uh, it was much more of a meritocracy. But the kind of class world that that Renoir talks about very much so. Yeah, question over here. Uh, but there's also some contrast um, um, among the men in respect to the valuing of ideas and learning. Um, Namely, uh, obviously, the noted intellectual in the French group who valued his volume of Pinar, mm -hmm. and he, that was understood by the others, although they didn't all necessarily share that disposition. And in contrast, the dismay when the delivery from the Tsarina was found not to contain any food at all, mm -hmm. but textbooks and works of learning, which actually were burnt, and even though in a sense that was presented as a comic scene, was that perhaps meant as some sort of generalization of what characterized mm -hmm. the Russian contingent? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an that's uh, element that works on, on <laughs> all sorts of different layers. Uh, I mean, there are, there are all sorts of um, uh, stories of, of prisoner of war receiving uh, letters from home that show no appreciation at all of what they're uh, what they're undergoing. Uh, oh, I hope you're getting out in the, in the sailboat this year while you're in Germany because the weather's lovely for sailing and this sort of thing. Uh, so I think, I think on one level that's trying to indicate the separation of between prison camp and home and the, and the complete failure to understand what's going on. Uh, but obviously the, the, the kind of image of the, the crate of books burning uh, 
uh, is a kind of disturbing prescience of what, uh, what might be to come. Um, disturbing in all sorts of uh, uh, all sorts of ways, particularly when you see that the officers trying to hold back the guards with the buckets of water to put it out. Uh, so it, that's a it's a scene with a lot of for a few seconds of a scene. It's a lot of content in there. I think we've got to wrap this up, Jonathan. Yeah. I, I'm getting the hook from the corner over here. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming, sharing your thoughts. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience, and come back for the rest of the series. Thank you.